Hello and welcome to the foot of our stairs. And today we're having a look at Rent a Ghost. And it's a show that I'm sure everybody watching will remember. It was created by Bob Block, who wrote uh, Galloping Galaxies, if you remember that one. as well as Robert's Robots, uh, Pardon My Genie, and Grandad, which was the Clive Dunn series. Now, according to Jeremy Swan, one of the directors on rent -A ghost Bob Block would handwrite the scripts personally, and then his wife Madeline would type them up to get them into some sort of a usable format. And just a quick note on Jeremy Swan, a brief glimpse at his credits as director show that he actually was involved in a few episodes of Round the Twist, which I did a video on not long ago, and he directed Fraggle Rock. How cool is that? So the premise is pretty simple really. So Fred Mumford, a recently deceased person, decides that he's going to spend his time in the afterlife running an agency that recruits other spooks that can be hired out to haunt locations and things like that. But according to the want ad, only total failures need apply. Deceased jester Timothy Claypole thinks this will be a great idea and fellow spook Hubert Davenport agrees, despite not being entirely taken with Claypole himself. Now, Claypole is played by actor Michael Staniforth, who actually uh, created the theme tune as well. However, the one that you hear on the series is a slightly tweaked version to the original that Michael created. You see, the Exorcist film was out at around the same sort of time, and it was felt that the lyrics talking about ESP and poltergeists and things of that nature were too much of an association with The Exorcist and they wanted to distance themselves from that sort of terrifying film. Even the Claypole character himself was recast from being a poltergeist, which he's originally going to be, to being a mischievous spirit. The rent -a ghost premises are actually owned by Harold Meeker, a bit of a dodgy entrepreneur who rents out the office to Mumford, unaware at this point that he is in fact a ghost. What Mika does know is that Mumford managed to talk his secretary into letting him pay only one week's rent in advance instead of the usual one month. And this is the premise of the very first episode. Mika demands rent and Mumford tries to get it. Now, Anthony Jackson, who was the chap who played Mumford, he was the voice of the four guards in the Labyrinth film. You know the guys at the door with the head above and below the shield? That was him. No, you can't ask us. You can only ask one of us. Mm -hmm. It's in the rules. And I should warn you that one of us always tells the truth and one of us always lies. Mumford decides to get in touch with his parents. Since his body was never found, they don't actually know that he's dead yet. And Claypole and Davenport tag along for the ride. In order to be as inconspicuous as possible, Mumford requests that Claypole and Davenport make themselves invisible. Claypole mentions that he can do that so long as his psychic energy holds out. This leads to the other passengers thinking that Mumford is talking to himself. A bit of a weirdo, right? Things get a bit out of hand when Claypole finds he's unable to stay completely invisible. Now, Mumford and Claypole eventually reach their destination, but Hubert Davenport, being a respectable Victorian gentleman, has decided that he just cannot cope with the hustle and bustle of this modern life, so he pops off back to the rent -a ghost office. The remainder of the first episode consists of the three characters teleporting backwards and forwards between the office and Mumford's parents' house, eventually managing to get enough money for the rent, thereby ensuring that they have at least another few weeks to get the business off the ground. Quite why they needed to get a train anywhere, is anybody's guess, because they can, of course, just teleport at will, can't they? So I don't know the need for a train, if I'm honest with you. So that is uh, episode one, how it all began. But you're probably sat here thinking, hang on a minute, what about those other characters? The uh, What about Miss Popoff? Come on. What about Hazel the Witch? What about that pantomime horse? I'm sure there's some more characters. Well, yes, there were, but they didn't really start appearing until later on in the series. So let's have a look at some of those probably best known characters right now. 
But before we do that, please give this video a great big thumbs up if you're enjoying it. There is a red button down here somewhere that you should be able to subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. You get a video like this every month, a retro telly special, so subscribe now if you haven't done so. And please share this on your social media, get your mates watching it, get more eyeballs on it, because if that happens, YouTube will then continue to show it to even more and more people. So please share, please like, please subscribe. Let's go! There was Mrs. Meeker, Ethel, who was the wife of Mr. Meeker. Now, Ethel was played by Anne Emery, who was actually the half-sister of Dick Emery. McWitch was played by Molly Weir, a Scottish actress with a huge number of credits to her name, including the Les Dennis Laughter Show in a number of geysers, and the part of Hazel McWitch was especially written for Molly, who had become a close friend of Bob and his wife after filming Life with the Lions back in the 50s in which Molly played Aggie, the housekeeper. Molly Weir was incorrectly credited in the stage newspaper in 2004 in her obituary, where she was credited as having played the lead role in Supergram. Supergram, of course, was played by Gudrun Ewer, who is still very much alive at this point in time. Dobbin, the pantomime horse, was of course played by two performers, William Perry and John Asquith, both of whom played another Dobbin in Aladdin and the Forty Thieves, the TV movie from 1984. These two performers also played the Merca in Doctor Who. Rose Perkins was played by Rotherham lass Hal Dyer, who had been on TV since the Dixon of Doc Green days, and was even in Within These Walls, playing Prue Marsh. And if you don't know, Within These Walls was the inspiration for Prisoner Cell Block H. That's right. Arthur Perkins was played by Geoffrey Siegel, another stalwart of British TV, having appeared in Z Cars back in the day and Emergency Ward 10 in the 60s. For many people my age, this show was probably the first time we saw Christopher Biggins on screen, and in this one he's playing a character named Adam Painting. Linda LaPlante was actually in this as a character named Tamara Novek, although she's credited as Linda Marchall in the series. Miss Popoff, played by Sue Nichols, yes, Audrey Roberts in Coronation Street, but also Marilyn Gates in Crossroads, if you remember that far back. She was also in the Hilda Baker sitcom Not On Your Nelly as Big Brenda. And his dog lead. Oh! <laughs> On the way home, he was telling me that he had another problem. What was that? He said he uh, Scoutmaster had disappeared. Oh, well, he'll just have to look for another, won't he? Yeah, he's already got one. Who? <laughs> Ask me no questions, I'll tell you no lies. Oh. The Miss Popoff character was actually a replacement for the Tamara Novek character, since Linda LaPlante left after the first series to focus on her writing. Those are the characters that I think most of you will remember best, to be honest with you. But of course, there were a great many more. About 85 characters altogether, in fact, over the show's eight-year run. Michael Derbyshire, who played Hubert Davenport, died in 1979. And Anthony Jackson, the chap who played Mumford, felt that he didn't want to continue with the series without Derbyshire. There was another spooky series at the time as well. It was called The Ghosts of Motley Hall, and it sort of went up against Rent-A-Ghost in the bid for ratings. A 1976 piece in the Daily Mirror was pretty scathing about Rent-A-Ghost, saying that it'd have to do a lot better against The Ghosts of Motley Hall. However, history bears out that Rent-A-Ghost ran for a lot longer than The Ghosts of Motley Hall, and to be fair, I'd never heard of the ghosts of Motley Hall until I started doing research for this. So who was the winner there? It was popular enough that Bob Block was actually able to license the right to Warner Brothers for a film adaptation in which Russell Brand would play the role of Mumford. Now, nothing ever came of this. I think Warner Brothers were not able to line up any suitable writers or directors for the project. More recently, there has been talk of Ben Stiller taking that role, with the rights now being sold to Fox. But as yet, nothing has materialised. There was a children's TV show called Rent-A-Ghost yes. in this country that was very well remembered. Yeah. And all these rumours linking you to that. Was there any truth in it at all? Uh, you know, there's, uh, there's a script of it that, uh, that they're working on, that uh, it's a possibility. I think uh, it, it could happen, maybe. With you as Timothy Claypole? Yeah, no, I, I would be um, Fred Mumford. Ah, oh, brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Fingers crossed, fingers crossed. All right, okay. There was a Christmas special made, titled Rent-A-Santa. 
The original broadcast date was supposed to be 1978, but due to a strike at the BBC that year, it was postponed until Christmas of 1979. And this is where the Dobbin character was created. So, Mr Meeker has decided that Claypole, Mumford and Davenport are to be rented out as department store Santas. There's also a pantomime being planned by Meeker, Aladdin to be precise, and the spooks are also involved in that, mainly to supply the special magical effects and things like that. But of course, they're not happy with just that one job. They want more involvement, but more about that soon. Since this Christmas special is something of a musical episode, we have to hear the Rent-A-Santa jingle first. Too many stockings to fill for Christmas? Rent-A-Santa Claus a day! We'll deliver, come what may! You won't ever hear us knocking, but we'll fill your Christmas stocking! After a bit of a to-do about who will actually play the genie, it's decided that Mr Claypole should do it, with Mumford and Davenport relegated to pantomime horse. After the rehearsal, Adam Painting, played by Biggins, offers the three ghosts a job as a Santa in his department store. Mika is complaining about his wife Ethel's portrayal of Aladdin, saying she doesn't live the part. So Claypole casts a spell on her to make her do just that, causing her to behave like an over-the-top principal boy in everyday situations. Adam Painting, pleased with the success of his renter Santas, breaks into a rendition of Santa Claus is Coming to Town. He knows if you're awake, he knows if you are good or bad, so be good for goodness sake. So, you better watch out, you better not cry, you better not pout, I'm telling you why, Santa Claus is coming to town. Claypole reverses the spell on Ethel after Mr Meeker tells him off for it, before requesting the presence of Mumford and Davenport ASAP so they can get into that horse costume. But they're double booked now as renter Santas, so Claypole instead casts a spell bringing the pantomime horse to life, before whisking himself off to join the other Santas as they fly through the city on a sleigh, delivering presents to Adam Painting's best customers prompt him a somewhat weird and out of place rendition of Swinging on a Star. Would you like to swing on a star? Carry moonbeams home in a jar. You'd be better off than you are. Or would you rather be a mule? More rehearsals get underway, which provides a bit of an excuse for a tap dancing section. And uh, shortly after that, the role of Widow Twanky is given to Adam Painting, surprise, surprise, in return for his furnishing the set with things from his store. Cue a jaunt with Biggins singing Keep Young and Beautiful, and we're almost at the end, folks. Keep young and beautiful, it's a duty to be beautiful, so keep young and beautiful if you want to be loved. And end it does. It just sort of ends and there's a roll call and bows at the end and then that's it. I mean the whole thing really feels like two completely different stories and the acted scenes really feel like they're only there to string the musical numbers together. Now there was a musical of rent -A ghost believe it or not, and uh, it was co-created by comedian Joe Pasquale. Apparently, he'd had this idea in his head for quite a number of years, and it wasn't until he was in I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here, when he had a bit of peace and quiet in the jungle, that he could actually formulate this idea properly in his head. The show's creator, Bob Block, was all for it, and uh, he even attended the opening night in Harlow back in 2006. Now, I recently spoke to Chris Rhodes, uh, the actor who played the role of Mumford in the musical. Here's what he had to say. So, so of course, you played uh, the role of Mumford in the uh, musical of rent -A ghost yeah, I did. Um, I, it's, a, so it's a show that I suppose a lot of people hold with great affection, uh, people who grow up with it and people who saw the repeats of it. But yes, I was cast as Fred Mumford in uh, 2006 in rent a ghost the Musical. Wow, rent a ghost the Musical. Yeah, uh, we opened, and it's funny the things that stick in your memory, but we opened uh, February the 11th, 2006. We did what they call a number one tour. Um, we did the Futurist in Scarborough, the Harlow Playhouse, I mean, sort of, you know, big, really nice, really nice theatres. And that ran for about 20-odd weeks. And we must have done uh, about 100 dates, I imagine. And then they'd worked out after that that they were going, they'd sold it up to Butlin. So once we finished the theatre tour, we did, um, it was 
pick up in London, and then we do Skegness on a Tuesday, Minehead on a Wednesday, and Bognor on a Thursday. So it was three days a week for about 26 weeks, and then yeah. over Halloween, yeah. well, we closed Halloween that year. So what what were the circumstances? I mean, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people, myself included, love to know how do you get these parts? How how did you become Mumford in Rent a Ghost the Musical? Or all <laughs> well, um, I I just finished my um, my musical theatre training, um, and casting came Christmas 2005 because um, we were going to start the start the show uh, rehearsals in January 2006. And there used to be, or there still is, it's now mostly online, a theatrical paper called The Stage. That used to come out every Tuesday. And so I saw the, the advert, it was still paper, I saw the advert, and I phoned my agent and said, put me up for this. And she said, well, I've already put you up for it. So uh, we kind of went it in a pincer move. So Terry Morrison, the director and the writer, uh, Natalie Cleverly, the choreographer, and a guy called Sean Cornell, who was producing it, I say, they were on the audition panel, and it was whole day of auditions and eventually uh, I saw people come and go and it's like you go in you sing a few bars of the song read a bit of the script they get somebody else in you read with them you go out somebody else goes in with them and it was about four in the afternoon and I um, they called me in and I said I think you know now Chris you're the only person we're looking at for the uh, for the role of Fred and so that was nice and yeah. uh, it went from there and then it was uh, right well I'll find the agent get the contract sorted and um, see you in January for rehearsals. Joe turned up with the producer, Sean Cornell, and uh, what had happened, in, in a certain scene, we're, we're hired as rent to to haunt a manor house, mm. and there is a, a bust, and Joe's voice was going to figure as the voice of uh, Ed the Head, it was called. Right. Um, and so in rehearsals, it's like Ed the Head, and people can read it in, director, biographer, when it came to that, and one day, nobody was on the book. So I picked it up, this line was something like, uh, Oh, well, Daffy, it'll be all right in the end. I did this voice. They all looked over at me. <laughs> and, uh, and then when it came to it, Joe came in to record the, um, the, the, the track for, the, for the, the vocals for this character. And they called me downstairs off the stage. And uh, they said, Mr. Pasquale would like to have a chat with you. I said, OK. And he said, all right, Daff, Joe, what's your name? Is it Chris? I said, yeah, and because uh, he just took that, not quite so squeaky off, off stage, but, um, and he said, so what's this voice I'm doing for this head then? And I said, all right, well, my approximation of your voice is, it's now time for semi-professional show business. Let, 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 let. He said, well, it's my voice. I said, yeah. He said, I can do my own voice, can't I, love? I said, he thought it was some kind of special voice he had to put on, not to want to use a, uh, any kind of language that offended him. Good luck, cards. The first night, he said, uh, "He said, good luck, Chris. Don't be, <laughs> <laughs> don't be sh one t right left." <laughs> but we were a very, very happy team indeed, and not in any small location. Thanks to Joe Pasquale. Yeah, great. It, it sounds like an absolutely fantastic time. Um, did you actually meet Bob Block, the writer of the series? Bob was very, very nice, very, very gentle man, as I recall. And he was really overcome. And he said, you've, you've done it justice, absolutely. It was so lovely to see the characters I created back after all this time, and see mm -hmm. them live on stage interacting. And he thought we'd done a, a, a lovely job, treated it with respect, but updated it to a certain degree. That was a kind of a seal of approval. That was like, that's it, you've done a good job. So, yeah, lovely fella. Um, God rest his soul. And uh, he created a legacy, which I think we still be talking about the TV show in 20, 30, 40 years. And it is a very, very fondly remembered show, and it's one that most, a lot of my audience in particular have asked me to cover for, for months and months, so I finally <laughs> got around to it, and I've finally done it. Uh, Chris, I want to thank you very much for spending time with us today. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much. It's uh, nice to be asked about it after all these years. One of those things I, I hold very right dear, but certainly a very special part of my career. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I never saw it, unfortunately. I would have loved to have seen it, but I never did. But did any of you guys ever see it? If you did, drop me a comment below. Right. 
Let's have a look at this rent -a ghost annual, shall we? But before we do that, just remember that you can support this channel on Patreon. Uh, you can get all kinds of benefits. You can get your names in the credits. You can get exclusive behind the scenes footage, which I happen to be filming on a camera over here right now. Say hello, everybody. And, uh, and there's also other things like sneak previews of scripts and all sorts of stuff. Head over to Patreon at the end of the video and take a look. Right, let's go. And here we are, ladies and gents, we've got the rent -a ghost annual from 1983. It's the first annual, apparently. I wonder if there were any more. Couldn't find any. Anyway, this spook belongs to uh, Marie or Marie Frost. So if you're watching, I've got your book. Ah, so your first thing that you get is actually the sheet music for rent -a ghost If your mansion house needs haunting, just call rent -a ghost We've got spooks and ghouls and freaks and fools at rent -a ghost Hear the Phantom of the Opera sing a haunting melody. Remember, what you see is not a mystery, but a rent -a ghost Mr. Meeker's May Misery Day. So quite a quite a lot of pages was that. It's quite a lot of things. There she is. There's pop off look. Oh, and some weird backwards writing. I would like to say how happy I am to be working for Mr. Mika in my present form as Nadia Popoff. rent a ghost see Oh, this is interesting. Look at this. So rent a ghost Series F, Episode 5, Scene 30, Interior, The Mika's Living Room, Day. And it shows you the positioning of the cameras, camera 1, camera 2, camera 3, the positions of the actors, and here's your storyboard. Shot 158 on camera 1. Shot 159, then switches to camera 3. We then switch to 2. For the close-up of Matilda, probably. That's very interesting to me, actually, as, as a video producer. Because I'm on a one-camera setup, so I wouldn't have these three things here. I've got that one camera, and I have to do a scene, then move the camera, do another scene. So... Uh, you can see how I do it actually on the behind the scenes uh, if you are a Patreon supporter You can see my behind the scenes videos and you'll see exactly how I do it, but that's fascinating to me is that we've got here Jester jest. Is this a joke page? Is it? Come friends, it's time for a jest or two. Can we have a for instance? Indeed Miss Popov. For instance, there are two flies on a door. Which one is the angry one? The one that flew off the handle. Oh my god. What do you fish out of the washing machine if the cat falls in? A sock in the puss? What? What's the difference between a kangaroo and a kangaroot? A kangaroo hops around Australia and a kangaroot is a Scotsman in prison because he can garoot. Oh my lord, that's that's terrible. Uh, what is green and crinkly with many many legs and nine wheels? The answer, a caterpillar. I fibbed about the wheels. Well, I've had enough of those jokes. Look at this. One plus two equals magic carpet. So. This shows you how they do what we would refer to commonly as the green screen. It's actually called chroma key. Uh, and they've used a blue screen in this occasion to make the background vanish and show them as if they're flying through the air. Obviously, you'll see a, a lot of my videos, I do this sort of thing. Uh, again, on the behind the scenes video, you'll see how I set it all up and everything like that. But yeah, it's, I love that they've added those sorts of things in. Oh, look at this, ghosts and humans, which is, of course, snakes and ladders. You must get to the rent -a ghost office and answer the telephone. Hmm. I might play that, I don't know. Ethel has started to sing Shrink Back Three Spaces. Is the singing that bad? That it causes shrinkage? Another comic. I'm not interested in that, really. Ooh. Hazel's Bubbling Cauldron. Jaws Pate or Fish Paste in English. One large tin of sardines, one pound of butter, no, sorry, a quarter of a pound of butter, half a lemon, some black pepper, some sea salt, and a tin opener, of course. 
ask an adult to open the tin of sardines for you, put them in a bowl, mash them up. That's basically it. So there you go, ladies and gentlemen, the Rent-A-Ghost Annual. Pretty good, actually. Anybody got that? I'll tell you what, Marie Frost, if you're watching, do you want this back? <laughs> All in all, Rent-A-Ghost is hailed as an absolute classic of its time. Yes, it does have its detractors here and there, but then everything does, doesn't it? But when you look back at the show, it is one that you fondly remember. Right, so that's that. Thank you very much for watching this video. Give it a thumbs up if you liked it. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Please share this video on your social media. And don't forget, you can support the Foot of Our Stairs on Patreon. Nip over to the Patreon page. There's a link in the description of the video. You can get your name in the end credits, special sneak previews of scripts, some behind the scenes footage, all sorts of little perks and benefits. Pop over and have a look. Thank you for watching the video. I'll see you in the next video. And I shall leave you with this rendition of the rent -A ghost theme tune. Thank you.